today we're going to uh, head to Acts chapter number 11. We're launching this series on uh, igniting your gifts, and it is a very important part of how we as a growing church are attempting to uh, acknowledge that all of us have a contribution to make. Uh, you know, in the old school church, we used to say that everybody can give whatever you have, whatever God has blessed you with through your time, your talent, your treasure, and your temple. Everybody say that. My time, talent, treasure, and temple. Your time here in the Bay Area, how many of you know time is money, as they say, right? Precious time. But God always invites us to imagine how can we set time aside to connect with God, to worship God, to serve the purposes of God in the world. Our talent, of course, are our natural skill sets and gifts, those things that God has given to us that are a result of our passion or our aptitudes. Our treasure is our money, and we just participated in an opportunity to give our treasure. And then our temple is our bodies. How do we ensure that our bodies are well taken care of and the bodies, the institutions that we are called the steward, and certainly all of creation, our time, our talent, our treasure, and our bodies. Well, often there is a great kind of tension when we start talking about uh, gifts and activating these gifts because we live in a world that often has perfected the art of comparison where we will compare ourselves to each other and start to feel inadequate because we may or may not have the kind of gifts or talents that other folk have. And isn't it just a diabolical trick to compare yourself to somebody you don't even know? <laughs> Amen. It's like, you know, you, you know, I don't look like Denzel Washington. It's like, well, you shouldn't because, you know, Denzel has a different gene pool than you. Somebody say amen, right? Amen. I, and, you know, I'm, I, we, we have all these comparisons. And, and based off of how these comparisons work, they can often diminish our ability to truly love ourselves and live into God's best for us. Well, part of what we want to do through this series is to help us not get bogged down in what one of our, our Bible studies we did a, a couple years ago. People asked uh, these questions in our, in our curriculum that often people don't see themselves as talented or leadership ready because they don't have the equipment or they have never had someone to train them or they've just, you know, kind of out here comparing themselves to one another. And I, I hope that this series will give us a clear pathway to not only activating the gifts God has given you, but also activating yourself to be used in a very unique and, and critical time. Uh, because as I, I, I spoke at a graduation or commencement service yesterday for some seminarians, I, I told them if there was ever a time your gifts are needed, today is that day. We're living in a world right now where we can obviously see all kinds of gaps and all kinds of challenges and all kinds of issues. And could it be that you are the unique answer to some needs that flow out of the gifts God has given to you? And our, our series, hopefully for this next few uh, seasons here, will we'll give us a pathway into that. Now we're going to the book of Acts. Acts chapter 11 uh, is where we'll spend time. Acts, again, written by Luke, who wrote the gospel according to Luke. Acts is like Luke part two, and it is the actions of the apostles. Actions of the apostles. It is intended to help us be constantly aware that even after you have an encounter with Jesus, there are actions that must follow. And your actions that come from your encounter with God often have a way of literally turning the world upside down, or dare I say right side up. And here we find some very powerful expressions and records of the acts of the apostles. And uh, so come on, we're going to do a little reading. It's 18 verses, but I, 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 I found this whole passage to be quite captivating, particularly as we are still in the season of Easter. 
we're still kind of reckoning with what does it mean for us to be uh, children of resurrection, people who are living our lives in light of the resurrection of Jesus. And uh, so I find this passage to be uh, quite compelling and an interesting natural intersection of this conversation we want to have about gifts. Verse number uh, one of chapter 11, I think it's on the screen. Yes, so now the apostle Paul and the believers who were in Judea heard that the Gentiles had also accepted the word of God. It's important to keep appreciating that the early followers of Jesus, the initial followers of Jesus, were all Jewish. And so they were Jews who followed Jesus, who came then afterwards to follow the ways of Jesus. And they were quite uh, caught up in their own kind of cultural, uh, religious uh, uh, sensibilities to the point that it was causing some division. And they were quite uptight about the Gentiles. Gentiles are everybody who are not Jewish. So most of us, most of you in here, that will qualify as you, amen, uh, unless, you know, except for you who are part of the lost tribes of Israel, amen. We can, you know, figure that out a little later, amen. But for, for all the rest of us, we are all Gentiles. So the apostles and the believers who were in Judea heard that the Gentiles had also accepted the word of the Lord. So when Peter went up to Jerusalem, the circumcised believers, again, believers who were Jewish, who endured circumcision. Circumcision, we all know what that is, right? It was a cultural mandate for uh, the, 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 for the male child to get circumcision. So all of these folks, circumcised believers, criticized Peter, saying, why did you go to uncircumcised men and eat with them? Verse 4, Peter began to explain it to them step by step, saying, I was in the city of Joppa praying, and in a trance I saw a vision. There was something like a large sheet coming down from heaven, being lowered by its four corners, and it came close to me. Uh, see, like Peter had a burrito, man, that night before that was <laughs> speaking to him, right? Man, vivid dreams. Verse number six, and as I looked at it closely, I saw four-footed animals, beasts of prey, reptiles, and birds of the air. And I also heard a voice saying to me, get up, Peter, kill and eat. But I replied, by no means, Lord, for nothing profane or unclean has ever entered my mouth. Man, I think it's worth pausing there. You know, P Peter, as a good Jew, right, uh, had never eaten the kind of foods that his Jewish dietary laws, we know those today kind of define as kosher. Anybody ever heard of folks on a kosher diet, right? Uh, that, 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 that Peter, following Jesus, was still holding on to his very uh, relevant Jewish dietary uh, restrictions. And, and, and what, what I find so interesting, I, I'm not going to preach on this part, but, but, but this thing hit me like a ton of bricks as I was reading it, is that Peter, when having this encounter with God, responds to God's voice. God's voice tells Peter, go kill and eat. And Peter speaking out of his cultural positioning and even his commitments, tells God no. I just thought about that for a second. I mean, like, you know, it, 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 it made me think of how am I dealing with my own biases, my cultural positions, my, my, my whatevers, and, and when God speaks to me, I tell God no. Man, I mean, you got to be some kind of somebody, amen, to tell God no. Man, I mean, it, it does kind of, you know, really drive home this idea that you can be following Jesus for a while and still be overdetermined by your own biases. That just following Jesus don't just make you unbiased, cause you to lose your 
bigotries, prejudices, etc., that you got to get worked on by Jesus and do your own work. Amen. In order for some of that stuff to get worked on. Somebody say amen, right? But, but I'm not preaching on that. I, I just thought I'd give you all that, that nice little nugget just in case you don't get nothing else out of this sermon. You get, on, get that point that you're going to have to keep working on yourself. We are going to have to keep working on ourselves. Peter, kill and eat. Peter says, no, Lord, no, nothing profane, unclean has ever entered my mouth. Verse 9. But a second time the voice answered from heaven, what God has made clean. You must not call profane. And it is indeed, this happened three times, then everything was pulled up again to heaven. Verse 11, at that very moment, three men sent to Peter from Caesarea arrived at the house where we were. And the spirit told me to go with them and not to make a distinction between them and us. And these six brothers also accompanied me. We went, entered the man's house. He told us how he had seen the angel standing in his house saying, send to Joppa and bring Simon, who was called Peter. He will give you a message by which you and your entire house will be saved. And as I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell upon them just as it had upon us at the beginning. And going back to Acts chapter 2. In verse 16, and I remember the word of the Lord how... He said, John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. If then God gave them the same gift that God gave us when we believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I that I could hinder God? And when they heard this, they were silenced and they praised God saying, then God has given even to the Gentiles the repentance that leads to life. A lot of reading, a lot of scripture, but it is the word of God for us, the people of God. Let us say thanks be to God. All right, we're going to preach from the topic this morning. We are gifted for this. You are gifted for this. Bow your heads with me and let us pray. God, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for the word of God that has been read for us, the people of God. May I should hide this word in our heart so we will not sin against you and send the anointing that makes preaching and teaching easy. And may it rest upon me and even the hearers of your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Let the people of God say amen. Amen. Uh, just tell the person next to you, we're gifted for this. We're gifted for this. Amen. Maybe pat yourself on the chest. Just tell yourself, say, I am gifted for this. Now, uh, I, I remember when I was uh, a child, uh, you know, my, my grandmother uh, and my mom, for that matter. You know, I, I was one of these busybody kids. Anybody ever heard of busybody kids? Any of you, any busybody kids? Amen. Okay. Oh, no. Okay. Well, I hope. Oh, okay. Uh, all right. I was about to say, man, I feel like a unicorn. <laughs> I guess not. Man, I, I, was, I was one of these kids who, who my grandmother, when we would go into stores, she would tell me to keep my hands in my pockets. Some of y'all finishing my phrase. So you, some of y'all been, t maybe you've told your own children that. Uh, you know, I was one of these kind of kids who would go into stores and, 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 and my hands would find things. And, 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 and uh, you know, get back in the car with my grandmother. And, and, and then all of a sudden, uh, you know, I just pull things out of my pockets. <laughs> and, and, and my grandmother be like, Michael, what, where, 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 what is that? And be like, oh, I don't know, Grandma. You know, <laughs> I don't know. I don't know what happened. And, you know, and, 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 and my mom, you know, we'd be in stores, uh, in, 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 in big stores. Uh, st uh, there was a store called Montgomery Wards. All right, amen. Now, now, you know, at an early service, people were looking around like, what is Montgomery Wards? Amen. So we know this is an older crowd. <laughs> Somebody say amen, right? <laughs> These new, new kids only know about t Target and Walmart. Amen. And Target and Walmart weren't here, all, you know, our whole lives. 
And I was in Montgomery Wards with my mom, and and you know, uh, you know, she be trying to shop for us school clothes and stuff, and and I be seeing the toys on the top row, and I start climbing up glass displays, just pulling glass and shattering things. My mom would grab us and run to the car. Praise God. They 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 appreciated that I had some busy hands. And and so to 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 respond to the busyness of my hands, they would give me uh, like Legos and 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 things you know uh, that I could you know put put together and pull apart that were designed to be done that way. <laughs> I remember you know when our VCR was broken. Amen. I'm a nine, ten, eleven, twelve year old. They would give me a screwdriver and I would unscrew the thing. And fix it. Somebody say amen. I mean, I, I, I'm telling you the truth now. I fixed our VCR. And then, you know, we had our ways of hitting it, you know. And but we, we couldn't afford a technician. So we figured out ways to get the thing to work. Amen. And, 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 and so, you know, uh, I, 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 I appreciate that my parents, my grandparents, they, they saw my hands as something that was an asset, even though for other people it was a problem. <laughs> yes, and 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 I, I remember, uh, you know, uh, the 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 time my mom she used to give us catalogs so we could we could pick our own gifts, and, and but but you know she would decide which one she was gonna get. And so we have these pages, I mean, these Montgomery Wards catalogs, and, and would give us a $30 limit. And we could pick up the five things. So, you know, I, I, I addicted to Legos and Transformers. I went in there and I would circle all the biggest Transformers under $30 I could. There was one that's called Megaplex, and it was about that big and that wide. And, and, and I, I circled it, and I, I just knew for sure that, 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 that my mom and dad were going to bless these hands with something that I could play with for hours and have great joy. And, you know, I, I was one of these churchy kids where, you know, I'd be praying, you know, Lord, if you just get me this Metroplex, I'll serve you for the rest of my life. And I, I, I prayed those kind of prayers. Lord, you know, get, you know, get me Metroplex. Get me Megatron. Lord, please, if, if you just do it for me this one time. <laughs> I don't have anybody prayed them kind of prayers. Amen. <laughs> Amen. And then, and then so, so, you know, I, 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 was, I, was, I was sneaking in my, my parents' room one night while, while they were asleep, you know, I, I, and, 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 and I looked in the closet, and there was a big old box wrapped. And I said, thank you, Jesus. Said, oh, my parents, Lord, thank you for using them. And I would just take that gift and I'd just be just, just rocking, speaking in tongues, thanking God for my gift. And, and I was just so happy. And then, then when, 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 when Christmas morning came and I opened up the gift and it was a chemistry set. I was so, I kicked that gift, amen. I, I just was so disgusted and think my dad, you know, uh, you know, threatened to put, lay, lay holy hands on me. Amen. They told me to take my gift and go downstairs. And so, you know, I, I, I feigned a smile and I said, thank you for this gift and went downstairs and pushed the gift underneath my bed. And I, and there it stayed for, for, for days and weeks. And, 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 and then I, I, I can recall some time would pass and I got done playing with all my other gifts that I, I, I had had from years before that I fell in love with. And I looked under my bed and all of a sudden I saw this gift that I had not opened yet. It's a true story. I'm not lying. I'm not lying preacher at least today. Amen. And, and, <laughs> and, and, and I, 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 I pulled this gift, out, this, this box out of chemistry set and, and I started to play around with it. And I realized that I had fallen in love with this chemistry set because it opened me up to skills and a world I had not even known I would enjoy. And I, I believe that this is often how God brings new gifts to us. We can often get so caught 
up in what we are convinced we know. The passions and the things that we are naturally inclined to do. And all of a sudden, we shut ourselves off from possibility of things we did not even know were within our atmosphere or our circle of possibility because we just never gave it a chance. I mean, you know, uh, it, 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 it is such an interesting thing, parenting, because often, you know, I, I, I would only, you know, be interested in my kids doing what I did. I thank God for their mama, you know, because uh, Sharice, you know, she is always interested in expanding their sensibilities. Uh, I, I remember when, when uh, uh, you know, that they, you know, uh, wanted to start doing activities. I was like, well, shoot, just give them a basketball. Let her go play down the street. That's what we did. And we were paying for stuff. We didn't pay for stuff. We just went to the park. No, honey, I want to do gymnastics. I said, gymnastics? <laughs> we don't do gymnastics. <laughs> what are you talking about? We don't have all this money for stuff we don't do? And all lo and behold, my daughter started doing all that, jumping and tumbling and swinging. I was like, wow, I guess we do do them gym gymnastics. <laughs> it was an expensive lesson, amen. But I still was too hard-headed to figure it out. And, you know, uh, the, uh, 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 neither wanted to do dancing. And, you know, growing up in my house, the holiness house, you know, we, we didn't believe in dancing unless you was dancing in the spirit. Somebody say amen. amen. And so, you know, I just had to close my eyes and while my wife forced my daughter to learn the pagan heathen ways. Hmm. <laughs> But 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 she found out she loves dancing, or or or, or Sarai, you know, swimming. And I definitely said we don't do swimming. I mean, we was on the ships a long time, amen. We don't be fooling around with all that stuff. <laughs> and then you know, Sharice uh, put her in swimming, and 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 it was a blessing for me to go to the swim meets and watch Sarai like freestyling and breaststroking and, 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 and butterflying and, 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 ba and back stroking. <laughs> Did I say that? All of them, all them things. I learned them all, just don't remember them right now. And I realized, wow, we do swim. <laughs> it is so interesting that we can cut off possibility based off of what we have been exposed to or what we have been told we don't do. And my question to the child of God, to all of us who have been created in the image of God is, how can you possibly cut off the possibility of you doing something when God has created you to do whatever you want? I mean, it is indeed the case, child of God, that you and I can often cut ourselves off from the possibility of gifts because we have been told or made to believe that that is beyond your capacity. But I'm here to tell you today that if God has given you God's spirit, you can do all things through the one Christ who strengthens you. Pat yourself on the chest say, I can do anything. I can do anything. I can do anything. Now, now it's so important to appreciate, you know, part of the reason why I love being Pentecostal, uh, coming out of a Pentecost charismatic tradition, why I love at least leading our congregation from that posture and that place or into this tradition is because Pentecostal Christian faith is often a space that affirms with radical uh, 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 passion and, and truth that, that we are experienced in search of theology. That we may come to faith with a certain theological set of uh, conditions and theological sets of, of, of frameworks and belief, but, but we also have experiences with God that don't always fit neatly in some theological boxes. 
Anybody ever had an experience with God or experience with anything and it didn't really fit the definition of what you told it was? Man, you don't have to be God, it can be anything. Amen. You know, you grow up, he's like, you ain't supposed to, supposed to, supposed to, supposed to be on that part of town. All of a sudden, you like it on that part of town. They tell you, you ain't supposed to go somewhere, and you go there where you be like, oh, I think I belong here. Man, there are categories that don't always fit your experience. Well, I love how the Azusa Street uh, experience uh, of, of the early 20th century where all these folk were praying and across race and across gender and across nation of origin and across class. They were in a prayer meeting and they were praying and everybody in that meeting was getting an experience of God that would totally throw into chaos the theological suppositions they had back in their home churches. I mean, in these places, you had poor and unlearned people all of a sudden speaking boldly about the things of God as if they were learned. You had women who were told to be silent and not preach all of a sudden boldly proclaiming the word of the Lord. You had folk that didn't have any music lessons getting on the piano, just start playing the, the instruments as if they had been to the Juilliard School of Music. Folk were like, wow, this is some deep Pentecostal stuff going on up in here. Why? Because there's something about the spirit that can expand your abilities beyond your own capacities. And, and, and it's worth noting that even in the Pentecostal tradition, there have been more women ordained and leading churches since Azusa Street than all of the Christian traditions combined. That the Holy Spirit got a hold of so many folk and they would go back to their churches and they say, you know, I got to do this thing. And the church would be like, no, they'd be like, okay, wait and see, because this is what the Holy Ghost done did to me. It'll put some fire in my bones. I can't be stuck in your rut. Amen. The Holy Spirit has been able to help folk be convinced that for this purpose, I have given you gifts. And I want each and every one of us in this room to be convinced that you are gifted for this season and assignment and purpose. That you are not someone with limitations to the point that if they say no, that defines your possibility. I mean, I tell you all the time, you know, if you don't think I can do something, your best response to me is good luck. Amen. But I often, you know, I'm so, you know, so, so contrarian that if you tell me no, I'd be like, well, get your popcorn ready. Amen. Because I know God's getting ready to do something just to make your no. Amen. Uh, opportunity for God to get some glory. Well, here in this text, we find such a great opportunity for the spirit to be unleashed among the 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 Gentiles and affirmed by the early Jewish believers. It's so important to appreciate that one of the first things your gifts will always do is they will flow from the spirit of God. That's the first truth I want you to know. Your gifts will always flow from God's spirit. Verse number 17, it says it so powerfully. It says the Holy Spirit fell on them just as it did on us in the beginning. I mean, one of the first operative questions I want to ask you today is when was the last time the Holy Spirit fell on you? And I'm not talking about like little drip, drip, drop, you know what I'm saying? You know, where, you know, it's just kind of like, you know, you, you get a little, little, little drip and, and you like a little bead across your head. Oh, that's nice. I'm talking about fail, like, like totally overwhelmed you to the point where you realize, my God, what is this that is taking over my whole life? That has given me a whole new way of thinking. I mean, you know, it, it, is, it is such a blessing to know that God wants to pour God's spirit out in a way that will overwhelm you and I. Not leave you the same. Not leave you stuck in the place where you previously have been and thought you could not get out of. 
Amen. I, 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 was, I was captivated by, by you know, verse uh, number, 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 uh, number, number, number five. Because, you know, it was so, it was so interesting where, where it says that, that Peter was praying. And while he was praying, listen to this, he was put in a trance. Peter was praying, put in a trance, and saw a vision. And, and I begin to think about how sometimes God, through our spiritual practices, has to put us in another state of mind so you can get out of your old state of mind. I mean, could it be that God put Peter in a trance because he was already participating in a false narrative? That had overdetermined what he thought was possible. Lord, I feel like preaching a little bit on this today. You, you ought to give your neighbor a high five and tell him, God put me in a trance. Amen. Some of us need to be put in a trance by God so God can give us a new vision. Because you don't think your mind is under the control of the limitations of this society. But could it be that God is trying to help you get put through prayer and through fellowship and through the worship and through the spiritual practice? God says, I want to put you in a trance. So then when you get in the divine trance, I can help change your mind so you can come out of that trance with a new vision. Lord, my prayer is, Lord, just keep me in your trance. Amen. God, I want you to keep me under your spell and under your influence so I can see those things as you see them rather than being limited by the false narratives of this world. Could it be that when the spirit falls out on you and I, it totally redirects your vision? So you can believe and see and be curious. See, one of, one of the greatest challenges I find uh, of, of what's happening today under the guise of Christian faith or Muslim faith or Jewish faith or even of no faith is the danger of fundamentalism. You know, and, and th th this, is, this is what we even find here in this text. Peter was someone as a Jew who had too much rigidity in his theology. And so the rigidity in his theology closed off the possibility of God being able to act outside of Peter's box. Be clear, all of us, if I say all of us, are in danger of falling into fundamentalism. And fundamentalism can easily be weaponized by the, by the elite and the powerful to do harm even in ways that we would say we are trying to keep harm from being done. Quiet, because we can get caught in the fundamentalist trance. Who I'm not, y'all can't get no help up in here today. Fundamentalism, and this is kind of what we see happening even over these last several decades, even when it comes to this issue of abortion. I mean, if you do research, and I'm not at talking about you, you know, that don't read nothing. Amen. You know, you, people do research but don't read. I be trying to figure out what is that? Amen. That's called an echo chamber. Somebody say amen, right? You know, you somebody give you a piece of paper that they thought of, and you don't do no extra. That's not research. Man, that's an echo chamber. Don't, 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 don't confuse echo chambers with research. There's lots of books out there. Somebody say amen, right? If you did research, you'd find that decades ago, this issue was not even a political issue. But after the passage of the Civil Rights Act, the religious right created a political coalition to respond to their losing of their ability to systematically oppress and keep out black folk. And they created a, a fundamentalist, not only reading, but political issue around abortion. And their explicit goal was to try and get Christians 
to politically align with their small government and right-wing philosophy. And they used abortion as a way to do it. And so for 30 years, people have been having arguments that are about human beings, whether you're talking about the baby in the mama's womb or even the mama, talking about their lives through a political lens and using religious fundamentalism to weaponize the conversation. Now, I tell all my friends all the time, you know, most of them is men who seem to be so, you know, obsessed about some of these things. And I tell them, listen, if it's true that you want to reduce the number of abortions happening in America, because pregnancies have been being terminated since the beginning of time. Again, research. <laughs> It'll help you. It'll bless you. Nothing you will pass will stop pregnancies from being terminated. Right? And so if, if the goal, this is why, you know, when I was in school, I, I, I was trained in ethics. I want to do a PhD in ethics. Because what ethics does as a department is it helps you to wrestle with the application of your truths in ways that do not do harm. Because we all make concessions. I hope you know you make concessions every day. Things you'd say, oh, I'm, I'm just, I'm just, I'm, I'm just, I'm solid as a rock till it happens to you. Then you start conceding. Well, you know, <laughs> the, 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 the spirit is willing. <laughs> but this old flesh, Lord, this flesh is something else. So I say concessions. Ethics help you and I to make sure our application of our truths are done outside of a fundamentalist binary of black, right, black, white, either or, right, wrong binaries that are so rigid that they don't give space for nuance or gray areas. And if you and I are honest, we live in the gray areas. <laughs> amen. I, I hope I ain't messing up. So I do. I hope I'm messing up some of y'all. Amen. <laughs> this kind of fundamentalism. Peter was, was so, so locked into his fundamentalism, listen, that when God told Peter to go, Peter said no. I want you to think about that for a second. God told Peter to go. Peter, not because, not because these folks over here killing folks, that, that could have been a good reason. But you still found Peter willing to go places where folk were willing to kill him. Not because these folk did not want to hear it, because Peter was willing to go where folk wanted to hear it. Peter told God no because his fundamentalism around his food was so deep that he could not imagine that God could extend this gift to somebody else. Lord, I wish I could preach to an old school church today. Amen. You and I must be careful to reject fundamentalism in whatever way it shows up. Or your experience will teach you how to do it. <laughs> you keep living long enough. Amen. You know, when you was young, you said what you never put up with till you get older. Then you realize, I have to put up with it. Then you get older, you realize life's too short not to put up with it. Amen. <laughs> Keep on living. Because everything you think you will never do, mm, you'll get in a situation. That's why I stopped saying what I'm never going to do, never not going to do. I just say, Lord, have your will. Please, God, don't put me in these situations. But if you do, <laughs> Lord, give me the strength to bear it. Why? Because if you are too fundamental, too rigid, you will easily break. That's why, you know, I remember when, you know, my, my, you know, my holiness background, and I, I went to school, and, and, you know, we was raised in the no smoking, no drinking, no sex, and no nothing. I mean, you just came to church. <laughs> I mean, you, you breathed, and you came to church. I mean, we thought Jesus was coming back. We didn't really study in school. We were like, you study? No, Jesus, I think Jesus is coming back tomorrow. I, I, I ain't got time for these books. 
This is what's ain't gonna matter in heaven. <laughs> then you keep li- you keep living. Right, well, man, Jesus is taking a long time to come back. I done flung five tests. Maybe I ought to study this book. I wish I had some honest holiness church kids up in here. Amen. You, you realize, you realize, man, they told me Jesus was coming back. I wasn't even worried about nothing. Now I'm 20 years old. I need my parents kicking me out the house. I'm like, I thought Jesus was coming back. Can I stay with you till Jesus come back? No, son. <laughs> you got to go get your own place and wait till Jesus come back, right? And so I, I had to get out there in the world. I remember when I, I, I was working at a, at a, Lord, what am I talking about gifts? I'm going to be talking about gifts, but I'm going to get there. I was working out there in a, in, a, in a drug alcohol place, and I remember, you know, I, was, I got trained as a drug and alcohol counselor. I used to tell, oh, I never, what I never do. I know oh, these old sinner dogs smoking, puffing, passing. Oh, I never do this. And God put me in the middle of a bunch of folk who had addiction issues, and I realized that my trying to cast the devil out wasn't working. I'd be praying, oh, in the name of Jesus. We say, in the name and they look at me and they'd be like, oh, you know, I, yeah, that was a good, that was a, that was a good prayer preacher. <laughs> but you know what? I care more about them dying than I did about my fundamentalist thinking about casting the devil out. So I had to expand what it meant for me to Get rid of the spiritual bondage of addiction. So I used to sit in these classes, and, and I learned how to, I, to, to, to counsel people out of addiction. And that was the richest experience of my life because I would watch folk addicted to crack and meth and all these different kinds of addictions on the first day of our, of our 90-day residential program. And they come in there frail and broken, and, 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 and the only thing they, we would let them do is smoke cigarettes. And I'd be sitting there all judgmental. See, you was really delivered. You ain't, even, you ain't smoke them cigarettes. You know, you, this is why I know you ain't delivered. And I'd be sitting there, you know, and I just thank God that these folk were so kind to this fundamentalist. And by the end of a 90-day period, I would watch how the Spirit of God poured out upon them. Would totally repair their life from the addiction to these hard drugs. And now they leave and all they smoking now is a pack of cigarettes a day. And I said to myself, you know what, God? You actually healed them. We have to give God the space to act outside of our rigidity. I hope that you understand that for your life. I know all of us got things. We wish our life would have went this way. I know there's still things I wish. I want to be an astronaut, and I wish still to this day that I could go with Buck Rogers and and Luke Skywalker and all these folk, and I could just, just fly. It didn't work out that way. I just born in the wrong century or millennium. <laughs> Disappointments. Life didn't turn out the way I wanted to. But guess what? Everything that God has gifted me to do by pra- by faith and prayer, I am living into those gifts. Amen. Why? Because God pours out God's spirit. And how God pours out the spirit, it gives you and I giftings. And so one of the things that I I think I I want you to wrestle with today is, is how do you imagine your gifts being connected to your passion and your purpose? People often ask and say, Lord, you know, what, what, what is my gift and what, what, do I, what, what am I supposed to do? Uh, I love how Howard Thurman, he says the best way. He says, don't ask what the world needs. Ask what makes you come alive. And then do that. Because what the world needs is people who have come alive. Gifts are intended to animate and connect 
the intersection of your passion and your purpose. They're intended to meet a need. And you and I must be open to the ways God will surprise us when God pours out God's spirit in an abundant manner. You follow what I'm saying? God will pour out God's spirit and start to give you a curiosity about things you did not even know. When I began to get curious about other people's pain, I began to see other solutions to the problems that I said I was so hung up on. I was talking to my friend who was talking to me about how we need to just uh, do this part particular solution to abortion. I told him, don't you know that the way to decrease abortions is to do three or four things? Number one, make them safe and legal. I think his head exploded. Bow. And sexual education classes and reproductive justice for women and their bodies. Listen, and health care for everybody. Yeah. I said, now, we have the same goal around decreasing this. In every country where all these things are happening, you have the least amount of abortions in that country. So as an ethical response to a dilemma, our response should not be fundamentalist in nature. It should be a hermeneutic or ethical praxis, practice plus application plus theology, theopraxis, a theopraxis application. And then, you know, you can, you can Google all this stuff. I'm not making it up. Research again. <laughs> Studies being done that show all of this stuff. So I'm not telling you to have to change your personal opinions about a thing. I'm telling you how do we faithfully apply them in a world that don't agree with you all the time. <laughs> People are like, oh, we passed this law, then you infringe upon my beliefs. No, I'm not just going to do it. <laughs> but when you use force to make people do things that they don't want to do, it's violent. And how can you serve a nonviolent God and be acting out violently? Uh, what am I talking about? Gifts. So, so the, the spirit pours out. And as the spirit pours out, listen, the spirit gives life. Your gifts should bring life. If your gifts don't bring life, your gifts are not from God. So you ought to make an exchange. God, I'm tired of the devil's gifts. I don't know. I don't want the devil's gifts. <laughs> Somebody say amen. Now, now again, it, it's worthy when we're in, in scripture. Hello, time is it okay? Okay, cool. I'm, I'm doing better than I was this morning. In, in, in scripture, it, it's important because I automatically thought that the word gifts in the Greek is charism, which also means grace. I thought that that was the gift used in this text. But in the text, the word gift in the Greek is dorea. And it's used about 11 times in the New Testament, in the Christian text. And so I thought it'd be interesting to just pull a few of these out so you could just see a distinction between the gift that is about your talent and the gift that is about your capacity. There's a difference between talent and capacity. We all have them both, but they may not all be the same. Does that make sense? Talent and capacity. All right, how about that? It's like water. We all got water. But if you got a two liter bottle and a one liter bottle, two liters and one liters, one liter, sorry, is capacity. I have the capacity for one liter of this same water, and I have capacity for two liters of this same water. The water is not better in a one liter or two liter container. It's just about your capacity. We compare ourselves to each other because we have different capacities. And think that, well, if you got a two liter, then you must have better water over there than I do. I remember my dad, when he was talking to us, you know, my dad, you know, he radicalized us growing up. We didn't even know it. Because we used to watch the Eyes on the Prize every single February. 
Eyes on the Prize, you don't know that. You should go look at that. PBS, Eyes on the Prize. It was a great, like, eight-volume series on the Civil Rights Movement. And we would watch that. I remember my dad said that the greatest thing that Martin Luther King Jr. and all them folks used to do down in the South as a protest was go drink water out of the whites-only fountain. Because psychologically, they thought, black folk did, some of them did at least, that the water coming out of the whites-only fountain was different and better water than the water coming out of the colored fountain. And they said when they drank that water out the, out, the, out, the, out, the, out the whites only fountain, they all said, wow, this water tastes just like our water. Ain't it interesting how we can have assumptions about labels and it'll shape our whole mindset. And sometimes God's work is setting us free that the capacity of what's over in that one water fountain ain't no different, or the, 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 the substance of what's over in that one fountain is not different than the substance in the other fountain, it's just different placements, different capacities, and we ought not compare ourselves to one another. So in the text, I'll just read a few of them, I can't read all of them, but Jesus answered her, saying, this is the woman at the well, if you had known the gift, the Dorea, everybody say Dorea, the gift of God, and who it was that said to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. Acts 2.38, and Peter said to them, repent, every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you receive the gift. Everybody say, Dorea. The gift of the Holy Spirit. Acts chapter 8, verse 20, but Peter said to him, may your silver go with you to destruction because you thought you would obtain the gift of God by money. Everybody say Dorea. It is about a free capacity given to you and I after the Spirit pours out in our lives. And I want you to walk away from the day convinced that I have a gift. Second thing I want you to just reflect on is your gifts will disprove your haters. Everybody say, disprove your haters. Disprove your haters. You know, you know, if you hear it the way, you know, I don't preach on haters that much because I, I, I just ignore haters. Amen. I don't feel like you guys spend a lot of time talking about well, how haters going to hate and they're going to do this and they're going to do that. You know, I just ignore haters. And I want you to learn to ignore haters. Because haters, gonna, they, you know, they're like, who cares about what a hater got to say? Now, it's worth noting, listen, that just because someone tells you something that you don't like, it don't mean they're a hater. Especially if they know you. You know, if a hater don't know you, like, I don't care what you think. Like, I mean, you don't know, you don't know nothing about me. But if my wife tell me something, I can be like, oh, she hating. <laughs> and my parents, oh, my parents hating. My bishop, oh, my bishop hating. They know me. They love me. They know something's out of pocket. So I gotta, I gotta listen. But if it's just some random, oh, I don't know who you think you are. Look at your shoes. Look at why you got this, why you got that. Oh, you're just a hater. I don't know. God bless you. I, I pray. I'm glad my name in your mouth, and I pray that it blesses you. But I don't spend no time focusing on people that don't know me, and you should not either. Now, if don't nobody in the world know you, that's another problem for another day. But all of us have people in our lives who can speak truth to us in love, even if it's a hard truth. But every folk out here, they don't, they don't know you. Story, don't know your journey, don't know what you've been dealing with or what you're going through. Hopefully, here at the way we can create more relationships where more people know us. But in this text, you've got people, these folk down there in, 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 in Jerusalem, don't know nothing about these folk out here in Judea. So Peter's like, Y'all out here criticizing these folk. Peter says, But listen, I saw how the Spirit fell on them just like it did on us. And Peter said this, and I want you to say this to anybody who ever like, be coming up against you, and you know you're in the will of God. Peter said, if God did it for them, who am I to hinder God? God's activity in your life is a great way to, as the scripture says, silence the haters that may try to speak in your ear embed themselves in your mind, or discredit what God's activity is in your life. You're going to have haters. But I pray, God, help your voice, your activity, 
your confirmation of the work you're already doing in my life drown out the haters. Move the haters to the peanut gallery. That's where they belong. That's where the devil is for me too. I don't, listen, I don't be, oh, devil, 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 devil. I don't got nothing to say to the devil. Jesus told the devil one thing, get thee behind me. That's all I say to the devil. When Jesus talked about the devil, Jesus be like, oh, but devil, don't you know who I am? Devil, I'm Jesus. I'm the son of God. I'm the Elohim. I'm the, I'm the beginning and the end. I'm the first and the last. I'm the prince of peace. I'm, I'm, I, I was here before the world started. I'm the savior of the world. Don't you know who my father is, devil? Don't you know who my mama name is, devil? Devil, why you keep messing with Jesus? told the devil one thing, get thee behind me. You, that's what you ought to tell the devil. Don't be arguing with the devil or devils. Yeah. I think you're on your job. Next time, the devil, just look at him. You ain't got to cuss him out. <laughs> get them behind me, devil. I just guarantee you, just get them behind me, devil. Just keep it moving. Yeah. Haters, devils, don't give them too much of your attention except to know that God's activity in your life is silencing them. Yeah. Silencing them in your life. So you don't doubt your gift. These gifts need to be activated now to bring life. That's the last thing. Your gifts bring life. They bring transformation. I love how the text says these have been given so metanoia. Transformation can happen that leads to life. Here in our church, as we're growing, as we're expanding, there are gifts that God needs activated in all of us that can lead to metanoia, transformation, that leads to life. When we are not open to the divine activity and surprise of God, we minimize our gifts. And we stay in places that God is seeking to move us beyond. Couldn't you imagine that everything you do as a result of your natural talent and passion, God wants to use the spirit to do the same kind of impact in the kingdom of God, the work of God, the beloved community, as Dr. King calls it, the place where people are in need. My hope and prayer is that we get to that place. Come on, let's stand to our feet, everyone. We're going to spend a few moments just praying. Grab the hand of someone next to you. God, my brother and my sister that I'm touching today, Lord, you know what you've placed within them as capacity and even as talent, as charisms. I pray as I touch them, Lord, they will not allow the narrowness, the fundamentalist nature of their life, their, their interpretations, their experiences, to cause rigidity that keeps them from experiencing the gifted possibilities that result from the outpouring of your spirit. Hallelujah. You said in the last days you will pour out your spirit on everyone, on all flesh. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Old men will see visions. Young men shall dream, see dreams on your servants and handmaidens. Would you pour out your spirit and everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. That's what you said, God. I pray, God, that this day would be the day your spirit pours out upon us. Pour it out on my neighbor. Pour it out on my friend. Pour it out on my comrade so they may see and know that this gift comes from you and it is needed today to help bring life to someone else it is needed today to help animate through the power of your spirit life even within them and so God send your spirit infuse them fill them from the top of their head to the sole of their feet and let your spirit soften the rigidity Lord into things and ways of seeing the world 
that create possibility and opportunity for your word and your work to be made manifest. Now lift your hands right where you're standing. God, it's me, Lord, and I stand in the need of prayer. It's not my mother, it's not my father, it's not my sister or my brother, but it's me, Lord, and I need you. I need you, God, to show me my gift. Show me my capacities. Show me my unique special abilities. Lord God, that can be used to build up your kingdom, your kingdom, your work. Help me to see and to know that greater are you that is within me than the one that is within the world. Help me to know, God, that I can do all things. Somebody say, I can do all things. Say it again, I can do all things. Say it again, I can do all things. Through Christ, the one that strengthens me. God, help me to believe it today. Help me to believe, God, that my gifts can take me over this troubled water. My gifts can take us through these tough nights. My gifts can take us to a new place of healing and hope and strength and power. Help me to know it, God, and be convinced by it. So I can live in victory and fulfillment of your purpose in the name of Jesus, Lord, let gifts flow. Let them flow and let them be realized in each and every one of us. In Jesus' name we pray. Come on, clap your hands and let's bless the name of the Lord today. Let's bless the name of the Lord today. Hallelujah. Listen, our hope is that gifts will begin to surface for each and every one of us. Our hope is that through prayer and through study and through gathering and through preaching and teaching, you will start to see that God has special aptitudes, capacities, gifts that can intersect with your purpose and your passion. And so be open to it. Be open to it. Give your neighbor a high five and tell them you are gifted for this. You are gifted for this assignment. You're gifted for this season. You are gifted for this. In the name of the Lord.